For 10 years now, Britain has been in the grip of an addiction. An addiction to a mind-altering drug bought at a very reasonable rate from South American farmers and sold here on street corners at a vast markup. It comes with many names. Latte, cappuccino, espresso, and for really heavy users, double espresso. Foreign names are invading our high streets to feed the habit. An American gang that arrived here in 1998 now has a web of 500 stores and is expanding fast. As for a doppio, these guys will give it to you, no questions asked. Except maybe for here or to go. But this isn't the first time that Britain has been in the grip of caffeine madness. A tidal wave of froth has surged across these islands, not once, but twice before. So this is a tall, skinny history of the British coffee house. Some South London railway arches are the last resting place of select beans from all over the world. Soon they're going to get a roasting and a grinding and then they'll be gulped down in one of the 500 odd shops owned by Britain's biggest coffee chain. They take their coffee very seriously round here. So I hope this is going to be a process involving lots of noisy gobbing. It is. Gennaro trained for 10 years to become a true connoisseur of the black stuff. He studied at a specialist espresso academy in Italy. 200 cups of coffee swashed through his face every day. That almost sounds like it's sort of circulating around your sinuses. It's the kind of exploding in your mouth. Exactly, what you're trying to do is really spray the coffee yeah. as, as quickly, as energetic as possible, so it covers as much as the inside of your mouth as possible. Because you do actually need to change the shape of your mouth to serve it properly. It's almost like kissing, so... That's right. Okay. Very attractive. Yes, thank you. <laughs> How do you find the first one? Smoky. Sort of flavor. Okay. okay. There's nothing is, astringent is it, about it. No, no. Is it, is it fresh? Is it slightly spicy? Is it slightly citrusy? Do you get slum I don't get citrusy. See, I don't feel my palate is good enough yet. Quite fancy a cup of coffee now. Gennaro obviously has Italian roots, and so does the company. It was founded by a pair of brothers, Sergio and Bruno Costa. When they came to Britain in the early 70s, they were appalled by the muck we drank under the name of coffee, so they started selling their own. A British company bought the operation in 1996, but they weren't stupid enough to let British people prepare the coffee. They left that to Italian and Latin American experts. The thing is, it might easily have been the other way round. We had coffee shops here in Britain long before the Italians or the Americans. In fact, if Britain had kept that early lead, then the world might now be full of Anglo-themed coffee bars. Instead of espresso and latte, they might be serving up drinks called things like fast and milky. The city of London was home to probably the first coffee house in Britain. It was started in the early 1650s, years before the Continentals had woken up to smell the coffee. An immigrant did play an important part, though. Pasca Rose. Doesn't sound very British, does it? But then it doesn't sound very Italian either. Actually, he was Greek, the servant of a London merchant named Daniel Edwards. Now, Daniel Edwards picked up a taste for coffee while he was trading in Turkey. At that time in Britain, it was known only to a handful of curious scientists. Now, when Daniel and Pasca got back to Britain, they started serving up the brown stuff at dinner parties. Their guests went home wired and happy. And very soon, they were coming around so often for a taste of that fresh bean flavor that Daniel decided to stop putting out for free and start dealing. 
Of course, he was too la -dee da to do that himself, so he got Pasca to do it for him. There's no evidence whether he made him wear a dinky little apron or a name badge. The new business began behind St Michael's Church, very near to the main trading area of the city. To begin with, it was just a stall in the churchyard. One of the customers who bought a cup from him, here in 1654, wrote down what he thought. The Turkish drink is somewhat hot and unpleasant, but has a good after relish and caused some breaking of wind in abundance. Interesting that he considered heat a bad thing and flatulence a good thing. Maybe Starbucks are missing a trick there. Within a decade of Pasca setting up business, there were over 80 similar stores in London alone. Coffee houses quickly became places where people went to do business, talk politics and find out who'd been sporting with Mrs Fitzsimmons. By the end of the 17th century, Britain had hundreds of coffee houses that spread as quickly as the bubonic plague, as quickly as the coffee shop boom that we're seeing today. And one of the businesses that supplied those 17th century versions of Starbucks is, amazingly, still in business today. It's remained family owned from the start and is now best known as a fine wine dealer. But its ancient logo is a picture of something you grind beans in. Simon, walking into your shop is rather like uh, walking back in time. How far have I come? You've come <laughs> 308 years. Uh, it is almost exactly the same as it was in 1698. You have the sign of a coffee mill hmm. on the ceiling. You're known across the world as a wine merchant. Yes. So why is that there? We've always sold the most expensive and the most precious drinks in the world. And if you go back to the origins of our firm, um, wine was rather a... Uh, yesterday's drink and the drink that everybody was raving about in the late 17th century was coffee. It is amazing how there are records that coffee was considered to be more narcotic than wine. It, 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 it had more of an effect upon it. Now I can see a rather amazing old coffee grinder here but I mean are, are there any other sort of signs of your coffee related past? In Plenty. The We've got bills for turkey coffee mm -hmm for 19 shillings, which is something like the annual average wage of those times. And these scales here, they were originally put up obviously to weigh the large bags of tea and coffee that were coming in here. But from 1765, we put a seat on the scale and we began to weigh our customers as well. Accurate weighing machines were rather scarce back then. Have a seat. Let me hold it for you because it will swing. Oh, it does. 56 pounds each, this. Bathrooms didn't even have a hot tap, never mind scales. So everyone from William Pitt to the Aga Khan parked their bottom here when they popped in for their groceries. Oh. So, 56, 56 and 56, 6... No, 13 stones. Thank something. the Lord for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How does that compare with Byron? We weighed him when he was very young and he was writing in his diary that he was dancing a lot. So he was, he was a little lighter, but that was no doubt because of the exercise. When Berry Brothers were still dealing in beans, coffee was strongly established as Britain's favourite brew. But it was about to face its nemesis. Tea first arrived in Britain around the same time as coffee, but for at least a century remained a minority taste. That changed in 1707, thanks to a powerful beverage family with a base on London Strand. Stephen, the name Twinings and tea go together absolutely, but was this a tea shop when your family moved here 300 years ago? No, it wasn't. Thomas Twining bought a coffee house on this site uh, all those years ago, but because there were 2,000 competitors within the city, he needed to introduce something to attract customers to his uh, coffee house and chose fine quality tea, and the tea took over. 
So when Thomas Twining began to sell tea, it was an incredibly rare sort of com commodity, but very soon we become a nation of tea drinkers, don't we? How did it happen? The ladies were excluded from the coffee houses. Social etiquette prohibited them coming in. And therefore they were looking, they had their own agenda to get their menfolk back at home where a little bit more marital control, shall we say, could be exerted. And tea was their weapon of choice. Those who could afford it, bearing in mind tea was incredibly expensive in those days, was served once or twice a week to impress an important business acquaintance the husband. So of course the husband was at home for this occasion, therefore not down the coffee house. And yes, that is how tea started to, to, to take off in this country. So tea is a kind of engine of social change as well then? Very much so. It, and seen as a huge status symbol. So wealthy families to show off their, their wealth would have their portraits painted drinking tea and then very kindly allow them to be displayed in public so that you and I could see that they were wealthy people because they could afford tea. It was that iconic in status. For most of the 18th century, tea was taxed at 100%. But in 1784, the levy was abolished, and what had been a niche status symbol went mass market. Tea leaves were the Burberry baseball caps of the Enlightenment. Coffee houses, a British invention, became much more common beyond these shores and evolved into continental cafes. The coffee house had to wait centuries to make its British comeback. And it returned to these shores thanks to this Italian invention, the Gaggia Espresso Machine, as curvaceous as Gina Lollabrigida and full of red-hot steam. Combining the leisurely graces of 17th century England with the colour, art and imagination of modern taste, coffee houses like this one at Kensington are having a new vogue throughout the country. A new type of cafe society is growing up in Britain. Today, places like this have become a regular rendezvous for people from every walk of life. The 1950s coffee bar boom was even more dramatic than the one we're living through today. The first British espresso bar opened in 1951. By 1957, there were a thousand of the things. By 1960, 2,000. But today, only a handful survive in their original fab and groovy condition. This example in the Kentish seaside town of Broadstairs was fitted out in 1957. It retains some of the key design features, many of them shared. The glossy formica surfaces, the bright colours, a modern white clean glamour. It was nothing like the naffy. You wouldn't pay for a cappuccino with a coupon. It was defiantly post-war. It's another family business. This Morelli was born above the shop. It was the place to be. There was no discotheques, they just didn't exist. Then everybody came to coffee shops in the evenings. That's where they met, that's where relationships were formed and started. And so who was coming to this shop? Sort of as you went through the 50s into the 60s and we would have sort of the, the rockers sitting at the back of the shop and the mods sitting at the front. And out the front of the shop you would have the right-hand side full of scooters and the left-hand side full of motorbikes. Did it ever kick off in here? And, well, we, we, we have been known to have our odd <laughs> moment. But we never got the shop trashed or anything like that because of the first sign of trouble, we used to stop it. But everywhere, the cats have their own little places where they live the gospel that this is the age of the teenager. Like the frothy coffee bar, the teenager was a creation of the 50s, could either have come to pass without the other. Some wise men discovered Cliff Richard in this lowly calf and the miracle of Tommy Steele. Youth 1958 with a lingo of its own. What's it got to say for itself? This is us, see? We're today. If you don't dig us, shoot away some square joint of the rest of the creeps. Well, why not stick around and get with it? Customers did dig espresso bars, but they didn't stick around. By the time expressions like daddy-o had gone out of fashion, so had frothy coffee in a smoked glass cup. 60s teenagers found stronger drugs than caffeine and other places to do them. But now there was a gap. Where was there to meet up that wasn't your living room or a pub or the bus shelter? So a few decades later, the coffee house made its latest comeback. This time it was backed by big business. There was no room now for quirky individual shops. The experience has been standardised. 
which is just how many people like it. Yeah, just as the first coffee house used the image of a Greek servant as its logo, even though the owner was British, we still don't like our coffee to have a homegrown taste. Take this chain, for example. Sounds dead Mediterranean, doesn't it? Doesn't mean a thing, though. It's the invention of a British catering group called Compass. Same with the Café Nero chain. Serves Italian coffee. Started life in Kensington, mostly owned by Americans. Fundamentally, the coffee house concept hasn't changed much since it was invented in Britain 350 years ago. The new wave isn't offering anything that Samuel Pepys wouldn't have recognised, except maybe the meatball paninis. And of course, the prices 